academic background? Mm -hmm. what, uh, what have been your main position at the UN, in particular with the Office of the Secretary General? Yeah. Uh, what are the lessons of the UN experience, the political lessons, the policy lessons? What do you do now in Brussels? Okay. And. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anytime you're right. Okay. <laughs> so just 15 minutes, very short there. Uh. Okay. So and so. Um, Good afternoon, uh, I am Jean-Marc Quaco, the, the director of the Division of Global Affairs at uh, Rutgers University. I'm also a professor of law and uh, global affairs at Rutgers University. Uh, with us today uh, for this uh, uh, global affairs conversation series, we have uh, Dr. Kostakos. Dr. Kostakos, well, thank you for here. being here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kostakos is the uh, executive director of the Foundation for Global Governance and uh, Sustainability. Fogs uh, is based in, in Brussels, but in fact we are, we are having conversation with him today because for, for a long time uh, Dr. Kostakos was working at the UN and more specifically uh, in the office of the uh, Secretary General. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, out of uh, all the years that he spent at the UN, uh, Dr. Kostakos has spent at least 10 years uh, working first for uh, uh, Mr. Kofi Annan the UN uh, Secretary General, and then uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. So, once again, thank you for, for being here, uh, Dr. Kosakos. And, and, and how did you, perhaps, uh, uh, to start the conversation, how did you come to work for the UN, and, and what is your academic background? Uh, my academic background is a bit uh, unexpected, perhaps, because I am dealing with international relations in the office of the Secretary General, or I have been before, but I actually studied engineering first. Mm -hmm. Uh, I always wanted to understand how the mechanical world works, and especially nuclear engineering, which was my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And after that, I thought that I would, uh, it would be easy then to solve all the world's problems uh, after having understood the nuclear engineering. That's mm -hmm. a joke. Mm -hmm. But uh, because afterwards, I thought it would be more interesting for me to deal with more human issues, and I wanted to work for peace and security in the world, mm -hmm. so it was natural for me to gravitate towards the UN. But I had to do a degree in international relations. So you went back to school and did so a second doctorate, right? yeah. Correct. And, uh, and so when did you start uh, working for the UN? I started as an intern mm -hmm. in 88 with the UN, mm -hmm. and I was very privileged to work for the Division for General Assembly Affairs at the time. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to witness the end of the Cold War and not the leaders who were coming back to the UN mm -hmm. and giving it more. You must have been a purpose. baby at the time, 88. <laughs> I won't reveal my age. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that should be another interview. Yes. <laughs> and and so in it was really, yeah. it was inspiring mm -hmm. uh, from Gorbachev, you know, to uh, Reagan, mm -hmm. who was at the time, and uh, all the big leaders and also new efforts to revitalize the UN, mm -hmm. to, ad to adapt it to the new circumstances, and hope that it would have more opportunities to deliver its core mandate of mm -hmm. peace and security and prosperity for and all. An internship led to a full-fledged UN position uh, directly, or did you leave the UN and came back? And uh, how did you, because you know, we are told that it's not easy to get a UN position, so how did you, uh, after your internship, you, 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 you were given or offered the UN position right away, or...? Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, I had to go back to Greece. I mm. would have liked to have stayed there, but um, I had to finish my PhD, okay. I had to do my military service, mm -hmm. and then it was a long process of working in Greece at the University of Athens and a foundation, foundation for European foreign policy, mm -hmm. while starting to go on missions with the UN. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was again an, an outbreak of peacekeeping and uh, electoral missions so I was very lucky to get experience in South Africa I was there in 94 for the first elections that led to the end of our tide officially and then I was in Haiti for human rights I was in Mexico again for something related to elections and I was also in Bosnia after Dayton mm -hmm. with the UN for nine and a half months in Sarajevo mm -hmm. so uh, I had irregular jobs, but whenever I, they needed somebody with my background, I was ready to go leave my job at the U in, in Greece and join the UN for uh, certain periods of time. Okay. And from 2000 onwards, I uh, went to New York and uh, 
I had a succession of positions, but they were not permanent. Mm -hmm. For your students, if they are interested to get a permanent job, I don't know for how long they will exist, but it is through a national competitive exam mm -hmm. that according to nationalities which are underrepresented, the, the UN employs people who pass that exam. Okay. I never took it because I was older uh, from the uh, yeah, because there is an age limit, limit, yes, an yes, age yes. limit when it was mm -hmm. available for Greek nationals. So you, you started uh, in 2000, you know, working in the UN Secretariat and perhaps working for the Office of the Secretary General. I started working on the Middle East and Palestinian rights in mm -hmm. the Department of Political Affairs. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2002, I was invited to join the Office of the Secretary General Kofi Annan at the time. And then you, you, you stayed in the Office of the uh, Secretary General all the way to last year, uh, more or less. More or less, with yeah. some uh, interruptions. So yes. that was more or less ten years. You're right. Yeah, yeah. And so you served right. un under uh, uh, Kofi Annan and then uh, Mr. Ban Ki Moon. So wh what were your assignments working uh, uh, with uh, the office of uh, DHG and uh, Kofi Annan? Um, there are two different personalities, right? The two secretaries yeah. general. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from. No, no, the assignments, in terms of assignments, ah. what were the things that you were doing, I'm sorry. Uh, working in the office? Oh, okay. uh, yeah, yes. I was with the strategic planning unit to yes. start with. And what is the role of this uh, This unit? is the, like the sort of an intellectual unit within the office of the Secretary General. Mm -hmm. It's not directly concerned about immediate developments, because there is a political unit covering political and peacekeeping, for example, a legal unit. This one was to think a bit more long term. Mm -hmm. and to help uh, draft some of the more forward-looking pieces of the Secretary General's work. Mm -hmm. Also, the annual work, uh, the, the annual report on the work of the organization was done through our unit, which means that we had an overview of the work of the U UN and the UN system even. So we could also introduce new elements and new directions that the Secretary General wanted to take the, di the organization in, meaning uh, I was, with this unit, part of the preparations for the 2005 World Summit, right, for um, the climate change um, high-level event in 2007, for the 2008 and other events, and then towards the end, I was also with the Global Sustainability Panel. Yeah, because over the, over the, over the years, your, the focus of your work in the context of the Office of the Secretary General uh, came to be more and more on sustainable development. But it was part of this uh, forward yes. thinking, forward yes. looking, mm -hmm. uh, that what we see that are the greatest needs of humanity mm -hmm. and what the U United Nations can contribute. Mm -hmm. So it was always this search that took me also personally from a more general strategic plan, policy planning, to more specific sustainability, climate change, especially from 2007 onwards Onward. with the new secretary, with the current secretary. So initially, so when, when you, you started with the UN, you worked more on security and, and peacekeeping issues, and over time you, you moved towards uh, uh, the environment and sustainable development and so on. In, in, in this perspective, uh, your, your background, which is a bit unusual because it combines uh, science and, and uh, international relations, uh, I would imagine that it was very useful because, uh, you know, one could argue that nowadays, uh, uh, the bulk of the debates uh, at the global level have to do with the uh, interface of science and, 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 and policy. And you happen to have this kind of background. Absolutely. Very, you put it very mm -hmm. well. And uh, I don't know if it was me who brought the issues. Into, I also helped bring these issues in the discussion there. But of course, these issues also, because of their nature, they um, direct me uh, into specializing more into the modern challenges, we call them uh, challenges of sustainability, and they are multifaceted. But they certainly have a very strong scientific, technical element to them. They are not just pure old type politics or geopolitics. They have a lot of, um, they go across borders, and they have a lot of the elements of sustainability, all three of them, which are economic, social, and environmental. It's not just about the environment, and I think it's clear after Rio even more so, the Rio conference of last year, that these of challenges 2012. of 2012, mm. that um, these challenges are interconnected and they have all these three dimensions, mm. economic, social, environmental. 
and with the background in uh, also science, it was easier for me perhaps to mm. understand. Yeah. So you, you left the UN uh, uh, last year. You are now, as I mentioned, uh, uh, in opening up uh, this uh, conversation that you are the uh, executive director of the Foundation for Global Governance and uh, Sustainability. Um, first of all, what, 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 does the, what does the work of this foundation entail and what are the goals of the foundation? It's a new, um, newly established organization and we have big ambitions, especially to generate a discussion that thinks out of the box. We want to really reconsider and uh, revisit a lot of things that we take for granted today and which we think um, are the cause of the problems of sustainability and of peace and security in the world. Meaning, we see today that the financial sector in the economy is too predominant and leads to bubbles and bursts uh, and busts and these cycles that nobody seems to be doing anything about systemically to rethink how this whole thing works and make it more attuned to the needs of the people, which is the social element of sustainability, because we want to fight poverty and uh, eliminate, if possible, we want to fight inequality, we want to ensure the well-being and happiness of people. But as Einstein had said, and I've uh, heard this several times lately, we cannot use the same logic that is, um, led us to the current problems to resolve the problems. So this foundation uh, tries to think really out of the box and to encourage new ways of reconceptualizing how we work uh, from the individual level to the global level. What does it mean to be employed? What does it mean, what is the use of money? What is the use of, um, and, and how these functions that are played by certain things or mechanisms today, how, how could they be fulfilled perhaps in a different way, but in a more sustainable way that would last over time and would not have side effects which can be deadly from a financial crisis to real wars, right? Mm -hmm. So, we, yeah, that is a, the biggest ambition that we have to generate that discussion and broad participation and change, even instill um, a sense of global citizenship and global responsibility to the individual. Mm -hmm. And we want to use the modern media, social media, to also make it like a broad discussion. Yeah. Uh, and so now that you have left the UN, what, you know, and, and uh, you have the possibility to reflect uh, on what has been your experience, what would be the, uh, the, the uh, political and policy lessons uh, that you would draw from uh, having worked at the highest level uh, in the office of the Secretary General? I mean, uh, if you had uh, two or three political lessons, if you had two or three uh, policy lessons to to highlight, what would be these lessons? Well, for the Office of the Secretary General itself in the United Nations, the, the job they have is impossible, really. I mean, because you are asked to be above the fray and to think of the world when everybody else is pulling you down and into partial interest, national interest, um, let's say professional interest, the private sector, the civil society. Unfortunately, I we don't have yet the critical mass of people and institutions thinking globally to get over uh, the, the, the problems. So there is a lot that needs to be done in the quality of and the integrity of the people, of the leaders. The short term is really now prevailing. It's not only the financial sector and the profit, but also in the political field with the politicians thinking only until the next election. You cannot have leaders like that. I mean, th there is a lack of leadership in the sense of people having a vision and testing it and put it out there. And even if you're shut down and you lose your election, at least you'll have the integrity of putting out what you really think should be done. Unfortunately, most often today is like, you go out there, you sense <laughs> which way the wind is going for your next election and you play it leader. I would not like to be a leader like that because I'm not an actor. I would like to help people and myself live a better life by taking some positions, debating with others, changing the position if necessary, and doing things. This is political theater often, and uh, yeah, I, I, that's uh, one of the reasons that led me out of the UN. Uh, it's not as inspiring, and it's not as practical as I would have liked at the moment. 
but it can change. Yeah, and so that would be a, a key political lesson. And in terms of uh, policy lessons, I mean, you are now based uh, in uh, in Brussels, and you, you you do a lot of work with the European Union, and you try to, to to build bridges between the regional level and the global level. And of course, the European Union is a you know it's very much an exercise of public policy at the regional level. Do you feel that? Uh, uh, and, and the UN is more about global norms, but uh, very little about global policy. Do you feel that if uh, we're going to be able to be more successful in terms of tackling global issues in the field, for instance, of uh, development as well as in the field of the environment, do you think that we would need more uh, uh, of a sense of, of policy at the global level? And is there something uh, uh, in your new functions, in your new location in Brussels, that you could learn uh, for the UN uh, at the global level. Just to uh, touch a bit upon the regional versus global that you said, I think a problem uh, is uh, that the European Union creates to the global system is uh, the fact that it's not a strong pole itself. Today, let's, it would uh, work better the international system if we had stronger poles cooperating, but individually also self-standing. The European Union. Uh, its foreign and security policy is very weak. It is still an intergovernmental organization. For me, it's not what it should be. The, the actual major powers are federations like the US, right? Um, Russia, China also. The European Union has to move in that direction if it really wants to remain relevant. For now, it's a good kid in the UN and the global um, political game because it uh, takes favorable policies towards climate, for example. It announces 20 or 30 percent cuts in emissions, even unilaterally almost the 20 percent, um, which is nice, can encourage others to work in that direction, but it doesn't persuade as a, as a serious actor that uh, can influence global developments. And you see ETS, there are problems now with the European emissions trading uh, scheme. So Europe has to put its, uh, to get its act together and to really be an actor globally. Now at the global level, we're trying to get specific policies on climate, for example, through the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We have a deadline 2015 to reach a legally binding instrument, which will, be, will enter into force by 2020. It, it doesn't go that well. We have to reconsider perhaps whether we go back to more national actions which have to add up to global, uh, globally significant action. Let's say if the US undertakes also major cuts and China the same. They are doing it, but when it comes to uh, negotiating, they have to play tough, they have their domestic constituencies, but individually they are doing more than they want to admit, and that's good. But it does not add up to what we need to do as world to stay below the two degrees mark, right? So we, we need a combination of policies at all levels. But still, the nation state is the primary actor. So the policies have to be there. They can be coordinated. There can be emission systems that work across borders so you can exchange these permits and all that. But still, the responsibility is with the state primarily. For me, the regional level, if the European Union becomes more integrated, it would count almost like a state for me. At the global level, there can be the coordination of policies and, and the normative frameworks that we talked about. I don't like necessarily any global tax, and that would also be a red flag for the US, for example. That's not the point. It's not to bring about global government. Yeah. It's to make the world work for all its citizens. And the UN has a role to play, which is not to, to control every detail through specific policies, but can have the, the, net, the normative framework and policy, perhaps guidelines, which the countries then implement in their own way. So much, much more work uh, to be done uh, in the years ahead. Yes, for uh, all of us, uh, Professor. Do Dr. Uh, Kostakos, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. We were having a conversation with uh, Dr. Kostakos, uh, who is the uh, executive director of the Foundation for Global Governance and uh, Sustainability. This conversation was part of the uh, Global Affairs Conversation Series. Uh, produced by the Division of Global Affairs at uh, Rutgers University. I am Jean-Marc Quaco, Professor of Law and Global Affairs and Director of the Division, and we thank you for watching, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.